Hello. Today I'm going to talk about SSH tunnels and some considerations you should have when nesting SSH tunnels. So an SSH tunnel is where you've made an SSH connection to a remote host or even local host and you create a network tunnel that connects either a local port with a remote host and then out to a another host or you can do the reverse of that and make it so that the tunnel opens up a listening port on the remote end and comes back to you. So just to quickly demonstrate how that works, if I want to create a local port um, 1234 that connects to foobar.org port 80 which is the web port and I'm going to connect to a host that I just set up called remote.host it's actually out on the net um, I just set up an Etsy host entry for that so we connect to this and now we've established a connection with this host and if we look at netstat you'll see that there's actually a port listening on our local machine on one two th on TCP port one two three four, and if I go to make a connection to that port, it opens it up, and then on the remote machine that I'm connected to, if I go to look out at port eighty, you'll see that I've established this connection with the IP four six dot one eight two dot one dot eight dot five, which is the same IP as the foobar.org is at. Uh, I can also demonstrate I can either make a request here or I can go to my web browser and just quickly connect to 1234. Of course this is not the foobar.org website. Um, the thing is is that since I'm connecting to localhost, that's what gets passed by the browser as the um, server name that I'm connecting to and so that confuses the web server when it's hosting multiple websites and it ends up going to the default page. So that's why I'm getting this page instead of foobar.org. If I go to foobar.org you'll see it's different. So that, that shows how a tunnel works. So now I want to show how when you nest tunnels, it actually generates quite a bit more traffic than just using a single tunnel. And what I mean by nest tunnels is creating a tunnel and then SSHing through that tunnel and creating another tunnel inside the first tunnel. It may sound like a strange thing to do, but if you do a lot of tunneling and maybe you set up some kind of uh, SSH proxy for your SSH connections you might find yourself creating tunnels that are actually inside other SSH tunnels so it's good to understand that you're actually generating a lot more work for your local CPU and that you're generating a lot more bandwidth especially if you're doing any kind of high network traffic operations like looking at videos or um, go, you know downloading ISOs or something through that, you're going to generate quite a bit more traffic than, than your actual content takes up. So I will create a series of tunnels that will actually go through a series of 16 tunnels. Actually I already have this typed out. Actually I'm going to scale this back one. So this is actually going to connect instead of connecting to that remote host uh, that I just did I'm just going to connect to localhost and the reason why is just so that you know I'm not generating a bunch of bandwidth um, going through my network and I can demonstrate pretty much the same uh, so this is going to connect to I have uh, SSH on my localhost listening on port 6000 and also port 22, but I, I add the port 6000 just so that I could uh, easily set up this for loop. So it's going to connect to localhost port 6000 and it's going to create a listening port of one greater than that. 
and connect it with port 6000. Um, so every time it goes through an iteration of the for loop, it's going to add one to the port number so that it connects it with the previously generated tunnel. And this will create a tunnel inside of a tunnel. Um, I have the sleep one hour here so that it actually, I can put all the SSH processes into the background and the sleep will keep them running on the remote side. It also makes it easier to kill them off. And then here it's just going to print out, you know, showing what it's doing and the date. You actually notice once it gets up to the higher port numbers that it takes longer and longer to log in because it's having to re-encrypt all the data through all the tunnels that you've created before. So I'll just run this. And it creates the first 10 or so pretty quickly. And it just kind of exponentially gets harder and harder and takes more and more time. So we'll let this go here for a second. You can see down here how much bandwidth is actually being generated to do this. You know, usually SSH connections are pretty low bandwidth just to log in, but just to actually, um, just to do all this authentication and re-encrypt it, it's actually taking up quite a bit of CPU and quite a bit of bandwidth. This is actually a program called GCRL-M and it's nice just to have a little bit of graphical feedback that's off to the side and you can configure the width and update times and add what are called CRELs to it. I can also look at the interface config and see you know how much uh, what the byte transfer rate has been so far so this is this is how many This is how many, sorry, sorry about that. Somebody uh, jumped up and down on the floor above me or something. So this is how many bytes have been transferred so far. Okay, so you can see it took quite a while. It took about just a little bit over two minutes to actually do this. If you happen to be going longer than you know this and taking longer, it'll eventually time out because by default SSH is, uh, grace time is two minutes so you can actually increase it by changing the login grace time to 600 or something thereabouts uh, otherwise you'll run into problems or it'll just time out it'll go past the login grace time so now we've now we have all these listening ports and if uh, and you'll notice that I've gone from 687 megabytes of you know of received data up to 1.5 gigabytes just to do all these tunnel logins. So you can see how as it gets bigger, it takes a lot longer. It generates quite a bit of data. Um, if I now go in and use one of those tunnels, so I'll connect to 6016. Uh, and then go to localhost. It'll take a little bit of time to actually log in here, but it'll actually go through 6016 uh, and then 6015, 1413. It'll have to, at each level, it'll have to encrypt a larger and larger amount of data. And you can see that over here in the gcrowm uh, network traffic chart. I was just chugging away. Okay, so it's finally logged in after about three, two or three minutes. Um, if we go down here and look how much traffic was transferred, wow! So just to do that final login took almost, you know, almost two gigs just to do that login. If I uh, press, let's, like, I'll press the A key right now. You'll see it doesn't echo back immediately. It actually takes some time. And that one single byte of the A character actually gets encrypted and encrypted, and each time it gets bigger and bigger. So it's it gets bigger and bigger, and then eventually gets to the server where it gets interpreted, and then the server has to echo it back 
a single byte again and it gets transferred back so you can see it came back after a while and just to transfer that one single A generated 0.2 gigabytes worth of data so if you create more and more tunnels eventually it'll get bigger and bigger I think I at one point I took this uh, up to like 20 or 30 tunnels and somewhere in there I was able to generate a gigabyte worth of traffic off of just pressing one character so you can see how it it grows and just to show you so I'm gonna log out of that, that'll take a while to log out um, let me create another tunnel where I connect to one of the lower ports where it hasn't nested as much but it's still going to demonstrate that it takes up a lot so I'll connect to 6003 and so this is uh, let's do 6002 this is three tunnels that's having to go through um, so that logs in fairly quickly but it's still actually generating quite a bit of data when it does it so now I'll come over here actually I'm sorry I want to actually open up a SOX port so another type of tunnel you can set up in SSH is called a SOX5 port and that's done by using this dash capital D and then whatever port number you want to uh, have it listen on and what that does is it allows any application that is SOX5 uh, SOX5 capable to connect to that port and then proxy its data through your SSH connection this is really useful because um, a lot of you know GUI and you know command well some command line tools allow you to do it too you can proxy your browser and your IRC client and your database manager and, and all kinds of things so it, it allows you to bypass firewalls and you know get outside and, and channel all your connections through one channel which is which can be pretty handy sometimes or it can make it so that you can encrypt data streams that aren't normally encrypted uh, for better security at least to the remote side once it gets there you have to worry about it. so I will change this to go to a manual proxy and you see it says SOX host, SOX 5, I connect to port 2000 and so now any connection that I make so if I go to Google it's just going to go through that connection what I, oh I haven't actually connected yet duh so now if I go to Google just to load that you saw that over here it spiked quite a bit let me do that again so I'll reload this and you'll see it spike a lot so it's actually generating quite a bit of data to go there probably I want to do a F5 uh, shift reload so it gets up into 3.1 gigs worth of data if I so there I'm at 4 gigs so just reloading the Google website once that uh, generates a bit so that's probably about 2 megabytes which is a lot more than what it norm I don't know it might be half a megabyte to load the Google page normally if I go to YouTube and start browsing videos you'll st see this start spiking up quite a bit look over here so it's still loading it's taking a lot longer than it normally would Mr. Owl, how many licks does it take to get to the 
owner of a toothpick bar. A good question. Let's find out. One, two, three, three. If there's anything I can't stand, it's a smart owl. How many legs does it take to get to the Cicero's house? Okay. The world may never know. So, I'll turn this off. Okay, so hopefully now you can see that a lot of data gets generated um, just by nesting tunnels. So if you're going to start using one tunnel and like as a like a master uh, proxy for SSH, then uh, and you end up creating an art tunnel, you should just be aware that you're actually generating quite a bit more data.